Hello and welcome back to The Path, the podcast from Lifestyle RX. Uh, as always, I'm Dan and joining me is uh, Dr. Brandon Byrne. How are you doing today? Doing well, Dan. Excellent. Um, okay, so it's been a, a couple weeks since we recorded the last episode that you will have seen last week. And um, actually doing that episode uh, kind of got uh, Brendan thinking a little bit and he decided to put together another presentation that we did as a webinar last week. So um, maybe, Brendan, you want to just introduce that and explain a little bit about uh, how that went? Yeah, yeah. It um, you know doing doing the questions on a Zempic or semaglutide uh, got me thinking, and um, and and it it, it ended up becoming a, a a presentation. I think it's like 130 something slides, um, and I titled it uh, you know with <laughs> uh, with great power comes great responsibility. The uh, the Peter Parker principle from Spider Man, right? <laughs> Um, and, and it really is kind of these drugs are, there's a revolution going on with them. And, and, you know, I, I think really, you know, as, as I finished our questions you know, last time, I kept bumping into it literally within days. I've got people that are constantly kind of texting me about this with new articles and, um, felt really compelled to kind of dive into it a little bit deeper. Um, and the thing that actually really struck me was when you look at the, GLP ones and what they do and how they work, you know, essentially mimicking our satiation hormones. Um, mm -hmm. And you look at what's happening on a societal basis with ultra processed foods, which are hacking our satiation system. Yeah. Um, it 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 really led me to kind of want to do a presentation where we actually present how these drugs work, what their role is, um, but also kind of you know compare and contrast to. Um, kind of what our food supply is doing to us and really ask ourselves a question. Are we not just, you know, having companies sell really bad food to us that's making us gain weight and then having companies sell drugs to us, which allows us to lose that weight. Is that mm -hmm. not kind of uh, a little bit insane? Um, so it was, it was super fun going through that. And, and, um, and, and I think it, it, it uh, uh, allowed, you know, allowed me to kind of process those, those thoughts and, and put them together because uh, I think on a societal level, that's the issue, right? Um, obviously, on an individual, you know, level, there are, are, are lots of people that eat, you know, well and and have trouble with weight. Mm -hmm. um, but on a societal level, you know, if we compare ourselves to 1970 when obesity rates were really low, and compare ourselves to now, uh, it's the food that's changed. And so, yeah. um, so if we're going to address if 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 these drugs are going to be positioned as the cure for the obesity epidemic maybe we better go back and look at the ultra processed foods and, and kind of ask ourselves a few questions that way. So, yeah, so definitely it was a fun presentation and, uh, you know, we just did it today, uh, with, uh, with the community. So we posted it, the event in the community, uh, had about 90 people attending. So that was, that was fun. And, uh, I've got a recording of it that will, uh, uh, will get over to you for, for editing and packaging into the podcast. Um, so just those of you who are listening right now <laughs> are probably going to want to switch over to, to our YouTube version to, to see the presentation. It's, uh, like I said, 130 slides and lots of graphics and images and things like that. So it's kind of fun. Absolutely. Yeah. And we'll make sure we leave a link, uh, in the Spotify or wherever you're listening description to the YouTube link. So you can find that nice and easy. So I guess without further ado, then we will uh, roll the video of the presentation and then uh, talk to you again after it's done. Enjoy. Thanks, Dan. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're right at noon and I'm going to get started right away. So I see that many of you are familiar faces and familiar names. So it's it's wonderful to see some of you guys again that have finished the program and others. I see that you're currently in the program. So that's great to, to see. Um, We've got a, a pretty interesting topic here, and uh, I'm going to go through a presentation. Um, you can enter kind of questions in the chat. I think there's a Q&A kind of set up as well. Um, and I will try to have some time for questions at the very end. Um, I really want this to be something that uh, that you get a lot out of. So without further ado, I'm going to kick off into the presentation. So 
this is the GLP one revolution. And, uh, and I, I've kind of subtitled it with, with great power comes great responsibility. The Peter Parker principle, remember from Spider-Man. Um, and you can't avoid seeing these medications in the news, right? Uh, so constantly kind of hearing about uh, these, these new drugs that are having tremendous effects in terms of weight loss uh, and tremendous other effects. Um, and so kind of over and over, we're seeing this in the news, we're seeing it uh, and really, it's it's kind of crossing over almost to that height perspective. Um, and we're seeing a lot of people that don't have type two diabetes using these drugs. Um, we've seen the drugs actually indicated for for weight loss, but we're also seeing people that are using it for um, almost cosmetic weight loss. And so there's a lot going on here. Um, so we're going to answer a whole bunch of questions today uh, around these drugs. And so, what are these GLP uh, one drugs? Um, why do they work? How well do they work? And when should they be used? And we'll try to provide some clarity about this as, as we go through everything. Um, so first of all, what are these drugs? Well, these drugs are essentially drugs that mimic our gut hormones. So GLP-1 is a glucagon-like peptide. One uh, is a, that's a, a hormone that you're in is in pr produced by your small intestine in response to food. Um, and so these drugs that call them GLP-1 agonists, they mimic the gut hormones. Um, and they really, you know, the gut hormones are there to sim you know, signal our response to food. And so these drugs are mimicking that response to our food. Um, and they send satiation signals. They send signals back that we've had enough food and it's time to stop eating. Um, but guess what? When you use these drugs to mimic the satiation signal, you can override and you can get actually weight loss. You can actually kind of override the natural mechanism and balance uh, and achieve some weight loss with that. And that's one of the effects that we're seeing with these medications. Um, so it really kind of opens up. And I think for a lot of people, um, it's really changed our thinking about kind of you know, what it means to, to maintain a steady weight. Um, and so, you know, traditionally we look at this from the standpoint of um, you know, we maintain a steady weight by balancing our intake and output of calories, right? Kind of makes sense. That's kind of what we've always been taught. Uh, our intake, of course, is eating. Our output is uh, activity uh, and is kind of the base metabolic rate. Um, and so this balance essentially between eating that base metabolic rate and activity um, has some feedback. And so kind of uh, as we are more active, there's feedback back to our, our, our brain. Uh, and it actually all happens in our, our part of our brain called the hypothalamus. Um, so this part of our brain is not conscious. We're not thinking about it. You know, it's not a conscious decision that I've been active, therefore I need to eat. Um, and it's not a conscious decision that I'm hungry. It's happening kind of in the subconscious. And I often like to kind of really kind of make this clear to people because, um, you know, so often we, we, we kind of talk about, you know, willpower and the notion of willpower and weight loss. Um, but much of this is actually happening, you know, subconsciously in an area of the brain that controls, you know, body temperature also, right? It controls thirst. Um, and we don't tend to tell ourselves, you know, that we need willpower in order not to drink water or willpower in order to be warmer or colder. Um, and so it isn't really important to understand that this is happening kind of deep in, in, in our brains and it, and it really is part of how we're wired. And so when we look at this balance between kind of, you know, that eating on one side from intake and the activity and base metabolic rate on the other side, um, we, we kind of see uh, that if we eat more than we're active and then we're, the calories are burning, we, we get into energy overload. Um, and so that kind of makes sense um, that, you know, if we eat more than we need, that we're going to get into energy overload and, and we're going to start to store some of that energy. Um, and so, you know, we can think about that balance by increasing the activity, right? So, um, you know, we've increased the, the amount that we're eating. Um, we're just going to increase the activity proportionally. So our base metabolic rate that stays the same, we're going to increase the activity, we're going to burn more calories. And of course, our smartwatches tell us this, that, you know, if we, if we, you know, you know, do that activity, we're burning 300 calories or 500 calories or 800 calories. Uh, and that we can just kind of rise uh, above kind of what we're eating by increasing the activity. Uh, but there's a problem with this. It's, it's just not actually true. Um, and there's a, there's a whole constrained energy model that's uh, been developed. Um, and it actually was, was a, a researcher who, uh, was doing studies of, 
the Hadza in Tanzania. So these are uh, people who live a traditional hunter gatherer lifestyle. They're super active. You know, if you put a if you put a, a pedometer on them, they walk somewhere around twenty to thirty thousand steps per day. Um, they don't have chairs, so they're never really sitting. Um, they're kind of crouching or sitting on rocks and things like this. They're just really active people. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and frankly, you know, you would think that they're burning a ton of extra energy. Um, but when you compare a person that is a Hadza person doing a hunter gatherer lifestyle and an office worker in Vancouver, guess what? There's actually no difference. Um, in terms of the total amount of energy uh, that's that's burned. Um, and so the constrained energy model really kind of says there's there's actually a cap. We actually regulate kind of how much energy we burn. Uh, and as we do more physical activity, yes, that physical activity does take energy, but it draws down from kind of some non-essential energy tasks that that our body has. If the activity becomes extreme, so if you think of extreme athletes uh, doing tr you know triathlons or Ironmans or you know, marathons or hundred mile runs, that kind of extreme activity may even cut into some of the essential uh, essential energy expenditure. Um, but from a you know regulating weight perspective, we can't just increase our activity. It's it's going to get constrained. It doesn't really go up very much. So it really does come down to eating in terms of how we're going to maintain weight. Um, and so when we look at eating, again, there's a balance and there's a balance between kind of our appetite and our satiation. And this is, again, occurring in, in the hypothalamus, in the brain. Um, so at baseline, our baseline appetite is largely set by the amount of lean muscle mass we have, uh, which really drives the resting metabolic rate. So if you actually measure somebody's resting metabolic rate, it's going to be proportional to how much muscle they have. And so that lean mass really drives the resting metabolic rate and kind of sets the baseline for appetite. And on the satiation side, uh, there's a, a hormone called leptin um, that is secreted by fat. So, you know, we, we often just think of our fat cells as being kind of, you know, just dumb repositories of energy, but they're really not. They're sending all sorts of messages uh, to our body around, um, you know, how much energy there is stored already. Uh, so leptin is that signal. It tells the brain how much energy is stored. And you can kind of think about this like a little bit like a thermostat or, a, a, you know, we could call it a lipostat. And so there's this balance. And, and if we think about leptin as the lipostat, um, what we see is if we lose a little bit of weight, um, the leptin levels will drop a little bit. The dropping leptin levels will send a signal to the brain to increase the appetite and maybe turn down some of those kind of, you know, non-essential energy activities. Um, and in order to kind of create that balance again. Um, and as we increase uh, our appetite and eat more, we might eat more, drive our insulin levels up and store a little bit of fat. Uh, and then the leptin levels come back up and we maintain this nice balance, right? That's kind of how it's supposed to work. Um, the trouble is that leptin seems to work better to prevent weight loss than it does to uh, prevent weight gain. And this might be evolutionary, you know, um, if we think about kind of traditional hunter gatherer, uh, lifestyle, that, that's really what we evolved, uh, as humans kind of over the last, you know, 150,000 years. Um, that was the lifestyle we, we evolved into until fairly recently, you know, maybe 10, 10, 15,000 years ago, people started to change from that. Um, there wasn't a lot of evolutionary experience with weight gain. It just wasn't really a thing in that lifestyle. Um, there was certainly uh, weight loss, right? And so we do a lot to prevent weight loss. Uh, and we actually see this kind of counter uh, intuitively now as we're trying to lose weight, our body resists it. And, and many of you know all about plateaus and, and some of the plateaus is just your body trying to resist that weight loss. So one of the reasons though, we, we, we seem not to kind of resist the weight gain is actually insulin resistance. You know, that, that insulin resistance that drives type two diabetes actually mucks up and creates a, a sense of leptin resistance. Um, so you actually can measure leptin. Uh, we don't do it clinically, but we'll do it a lot in research. And you'll see people have very sometimes you know, very high levels of leptin, which should be sending a signal to the brain that uh, you know there's lots of energy on board, um, but it doesn't seem to work. And it, it seems that insulin resistance has a big role in that. Um, so that's at baseline. Now let's look at kind of episodic or kind of meal to meal. And what we see here is it's back to those gut hormones. And essentially, you know, on our appetite side, we have uh, ghrelin, uh, which is a hormone released by our stomach. 
Um, and it's that kind of, uh, you know, extremely, <laughs> when your growth levels are high, you're, you know, you're very hungry. It sends that signal of, of hunger. Uh, on the satiation side, we have a whole bunch, right? So GLP-1, which is, is what these drugs mimic. GIP, which actually, uh, the, you know, terzepatide also mimics GIP to some extent. Um, PYY, you know, CCK, uh, and about nine more. Um, and so really kind of what's happening here is, uh, we, we're releasing a lot of hormones from our intestine to signal kind of when we've had enough food. Um, and it's really signaling this response to the food that we eat. Um, even stretch receptors from our stomach send us signals. Um, and it really is kind of amazing because if you think about it, if you think about all the variety of food that we might eat, so we're looking at all different kinds of food that we're going to eat, and they're all going to come into our digestive tract, and our body's got to send a signal as to when we've had enough. It's quite amazing that most people can, uh, you know, or many people can maintain uh, steady weight, uh, and that traditionally we we did maintain steady weight. And so when you see this kind of variety of food that we've got to interpret and send the signal back to our brains, um, you know, that's and to tell us that we are satiated, that we've had enough to maintain that balance. It, it really is quite an amazing system. And it's amazingly precise. Um, if we look at it from, you know, the amount of calories a person will eat in a year, it's somewhere around 1.25 million calories. Um, and to maintain that balance over the year, um, is really happening because we're, if we're getting the right signals. And so this balance that's maintained uh, is, is, is what we need to do to maintain a steady weight. Well, let's look at what the GLP-1 drugs do. Um, so they work in the hypothalamus, uh, amongst other places. They work all over the body. But in terms of the, you know, the weight loss effects, they really work in the hypothalamus, which kind of makes sense because that's where the action's happening to maintain this balance. Uh, and essentially what they do is they, they really decrease appetite and increase satiation. And so we're just not that hungry when we're on these drugs and we start to lose weight. We just simply don't eat as much uh, when we're on these drugs. And so if you look at the drugs, they, they actually have a whole bunch of other effects. Um, and so these effects are, um, they're, they're actually things that are very useful in response to food. Um, so they send signals to the, the liver to decrease some, you know, glucose production, decrease, uh, uh, you know, the storage of fat really because they're signaling that, you know, there's, there's, there's energy coming on board from, from outside. Um, they slow down the stomach emptying. So they actually slow things down. So we feel full, uh, and they slow down the intestinal movement as well as to kind of get that feeling of fullness. They send the direct signal to, you know, from the intestine to the brain to decrease appetite. Um, they also send a signal to decrease palatability. So as we get full, things don't taste as good, right? And it also decreases the reward. We just no longer want to eat that, even if it's something that we really like. Um, they also send signals to the muscle to increase insulin sensitivity. So this is kind of one of the reasons they're really helpful in type 2 diabetes is um, we can get more of the glucose that we've eaten into the muscle. So we can increase that glucose uptake. Um, and uh, that last one should say pancreas, but they they increase uh, insulin release. Uh, and this one sounds kind of counterproductive because often we're telling you in, in, in the program around, you know, so we, we don't, we, we want to eat in such a way that we don't need as much insulin. Um, but what they do is they actually send, it's the first path, the first phase of insulin release that they increase. So these drugs send a quick signal to the pancreas, which in turn will um, release a little bit more insulin um, in order to kind of turn off the, the glucose coming from the liver. So it's actually a really important little effect. The other thing they do is they decrease glucagon. And we don't talk about that that much in our 4 plus 2 program, um, but glucagon levels are higher in type 2 diabetics. And glucagon sends a constant signal to the liver to produce a, a little bit more blood sugar. Um, and for often for people, especially as the tail end of remission journey, we'll often see this, this kind of glu extra glucagon effect that can be a problem. So from a, a drug perspective, if these drugs are mimicking that, um, that's kind of helpful for us just because it'll, it'll, it'll get, give us a little bit better fasting blood sugar control. So I can't talk about the GLP ones, uh, without talking about ultra processed foods because the GLP ones are mimicking our satiation response to, to food. I think it really is helpful to actually take a step back and look at what's happening in our food system. And so if we look at ultra processed foods, um, 
first of all, a definition. So these are formulations, right? They're not really kind of, you know, they're kind of manufactured. They come from factories of cheap industrial sources of dietary energy and nutrients. So they've extracted nutrients from other foods um, using kind of a series of processes and they don't contain any whole foods anymore. So whole foods are kind of foods that, you know, are still within the cellular formation that they're grown, right? Yeah, think of broccoli, right? You're actually eating broccoli cells. Um, you think of fish, you're actually eating, you know, fish cells from the muscle of the fish. Um, here, the, you know, things have been extracted from those sources. Um, and the, the, they're also really designed in such a way to be highly profitable, right? Because these foods are created by companies that want to sell you more of them and they want you to eat more of them. Um, so they're low cost. Um, they're actually amazingly low cost when we look at the nutrient kind of density and calories that are in them. They have a very long shelf life, uh, and and that's a whole other set of issues around ultra processed foods. They're convenient and they're hyper palatable. They're actually really designed to kind of you know trigger a reward response. You're going to want to eat more of them. Um, and if we look at kind of the the uh, overall classification, the ultra processed foods are the ones in 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 the red there. So um, you know minimally processed, those ones make sense. Um, there are some processed ingredients, you know, things like salt, sugar, vegetable oils, uh, butter, other fats get a little bit more processed when you start to look at kind of, you know, um, you know, uh, breads or cheeses or things like that, where, um, you know, there has been some processing going on. Um, but you can kind of do the, the, you know, great grandmother test, right? Pretty much up to processed foods. Your great grandmother might've seen those foods. Um, but the ultra processed foods, I suspect your great grandmother never did see those, these types of foods. So they're relatively new to our, to our system. Um, they're low in fiber. So they, they you know, because they, they, they've extracted them from whole foods. So there's often no fiber with them, uh, which makes them absorb super quickly. And they, they actually, uh, the, 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 the carbohydrate and fat and protein from them gets uh, absorbed very, very quickly without the fiber. They're high in refined carbs, um, so carbs that turn quickly into glucose will spike some insulin. Um, that insulin will help store that energy immediately. Um, they're high in fats and not really great fats for you, kind of uh, some inflammatory vegetable oils and saturated fats. Uh, and again, kind of in the context of the carbs that they come with, that insulin is going to pack that fat away into storage pretty quickly because they're high in fat and carbs, they're high in calories. And then they're also high in salt to drive craving and they're high in sugar, of course, to drive more craving as well. So you're going to tend to eat more of them. Um, and so when we look at these ultra processed foods, you know, we can see that there's a real problem um, in terms of you know, how we're going to, you know, what, what sort of satiation response we're going to have. Um, so I always like to kind of reference this study, uh, Kevin Hall, who is a Canadian actually, and he uh, works in the U.S. at in in Bethesda, just outside of Washington D.C. at National Institute for Health. Um, super well regarded researcher uh, did this very famous experiment in in uh, 2019, and really what he did was he 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 took kind of uh, an ultra processed food versus a I call it a whole food or kind of an unprocessed food diet, um, and really it was kind of eat as much as you want. And so uh, in both kind of situations, uh, people were, you know, the, the meals were matched, right? So this is what's actually amazing with this. And, and uh, it's something that sometimes when we go through it in the program, we don't always go through in as much detail. These meals were matched for calories. So what was presented to somebody had the same amount of calories, the same amount of sugar, the same amount of fat, the same amount of fiber. They actually had to use fiber supplements to get the fiber. So they had to mix some fiber supplements, uh, I think with the, the, the lemonade drink that they had in the ultra processed diet, matched on protein and matched on carbs, right? So they kind of did matching meals and, uh, and people were in a metabolic ward, which just meant that they could, they could measure absolutely everything. So they could measure truly how much energy was being, you know, expended. They could measure, uh, how much energy was, was taken in. Um, and so, Half were started on kind of the whole food or the unprocessed food diet. So if you kind of look at these meals, you know, that's what they got for breakfast. You know, they kind of had a, a, a bit a bit more variety, but the, you know, kind of looked like that. Uh, and that was lunch and dinner. And then they had snacks uh, and they were allowed to eat as much as they wanted. So uh, everybody could, you know, uh, eat, you know, they could, they, they could basically, they'd get presented with exactly the same kind of a, you know, balanced meal. Um, but if they wanted more, they could have more, they could have more snacks. 
Um, but they're all pretty kind of, you know, the, these are things that you'd all recognize. Um, and then they did that for 14 days and then they were switched to the ultra processed food diet. Uh, and, and then uh, one, one other group was started on ultra processed first and then switched to whole food. So they kind of had these two, two different groups kind of running. Um, and so they got a breakfast that looked like this on the ultra processed food diet with some kind of lemonade, kind of sugary drinks. Um, and that was kind of lunch. That was dinner. And there's some snacks. So you can see kind of some, some of the brand names on the snacks. Um, and so again, eat as much as you want uh, and let's see what happens. Um, and this isn't, you know, <laughs> you know keep driving this one home. This isn't quite the same as eating ultra processed food kind of in the wild or like what we would be doing because remember he actually, you know, took the effort to match on fiber, right? So, you know, he actually gave back some of the, the things that, um, that, that, you know, ultra processed food diet, if you're just kind of having it at home, you wouldn't even be getting. Um, and so here's what, what he found, right? And so first of all, what you see is people just ate more on the ultra processed food diet. So now they're comparing each person's compared to themselves. So they're comparing themselves on the ultra processed food diet to themselves on the whole food diet. People overate about 500 calories per day, 230 calories of extra fat, 230 calories of extra carbs. Actually, interestingly, again, back to brain mechanisms of balance and, and kind of maintaining protein was unchanged. So there's a separate regulator for protein that seems to have not been affected by this. They were presented with the same amount of protein. They ate the same amount of protein, but they overate the fat and carbs to a whopping total of you know, 500 calories per day. Uh, and, and you can see kind of uh, on the bottom of the graph that the people on the ultra processed food diet gained weight as the, as the two weeks went on. Uh, and people on the whole, whole food diet actually lost weight as, as time went on and, and they had access to, to as much food as they wanted. Um, interestingly, people on the ultra processed food diet ate faster, 17 calories per minute faster. And actually, if you look at the, the if, you, if you kind of break it down, that may have been most of the difference. It was, was simply that people ate faster. Um, they ate almost the same amount of time. Um, but that would end up producing the, the calorie difference for, for each meal. It's just that they would consume this food much faster on the whole food diet. People lost some weight and they actually ate less, right? And, uh, and, so, and they obviously ate slower. Um, and we saw some increases in appetite suppressing hormones like PYY. And we saw some decreases in hormone, uh, the hunger hormone ghrelin. Uh, so it kind of, you know, it really tells us kind of what, what's happening with, with that ultra processed versus whole food diet. So these ultra processed foods are a little bit like stealth calories. They they do not generate the same satiation signal that the the whole foods do. Um, but that's not all that we see with ultra processed foods. Um, and so eating is an activity that's driven by an expectation of pleasure. We kind of look forward to eating. And uh, I love this little picture of this guy, right? It just looks like pleasure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and pleasure is actually two things. There's actually the wanting component and the liking component of this. And this is important to understand when we think about ultra processed foods. So when we look at kind of the, uh, you know, the wanting perspective, uh, we actually naturally want because these you know, things, foods that are sweet, foods that are salty, foods that are fatty, uh, kind of that umami or savory taste, uh, things that are starchy, things that are crunchy, things with high calorie density. These actually all drive reward responses for us. Um, oh, and guess what? Ultra processed foods are often sweet, salty, fatty. They've got the savory kind of thing down, starchy, crunchy, high can, you know, so the ultra processed foods mimic these things and the companies know this. Um, and this wanting is driven by dopamine, right? So it's, there's pathways in our brain, again, not conscious pathways, um, but the dopamine pathways drive this wanting or desire for the food. Um, and so when we look at this, it's kind of wanting, it's the incentive, it's the motivation, it's the excitement, it's craving. Um, and we start to crave these foods. And you can even say it's desire. And I just have to emphasize this over and over. This is not rational, right? This is being driven at a level that isn't part of your willpower. It's not part of your consciousness. Um, and so it's driven by dopamine. Um, and so dopamine actually isn't the liking part. It's the wanting part. And it's uh, the, you know, if we look at kind of the, the, the neurobiology of it, it's kind of a reward prediction. 
we want these foods because we know that there's reward there in this that's driven by dopamine. The liking part is driven by a whole bunch of other uh, hormones that uh, uh, Robert Lustig, a, 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 a pediatrician in San Francisco, kind of calls the here and now hormones, right? Serotonin, oxytocin, and endorphins, endocannabinoids. These are these are kind of hormones that kind of are pleasurable, and they're released by by things that are pleasurable, um, and so taste is a big part of this and it's a key input for the liking of food uh, and taste traditionally has given us the information of how much energy and nutrition is in the food um, and so again subconsciously you know we don't kind of consciously go oh, you, know, you know this is this is an egg it's got eight grams of protein um, but uh, when we taste food we actually kind of know from the texture of the food uh, what the expected kind of energy and, and nutrition complement will be. And food taste and its nutrient value have actually been predictive for all of evolutionary history. So as during our hunter-gatherer stages, you know, we, we largely would know kind of what, what we ate. Um, and even through the agricultural stage of, of eating, we would know um, because they are whole foods and, and they were designed to send these signals the right way. This mis mismatch between our liking and wanting systems drives appetite and it drives overeating. And so again, kind of this way to think about it is these ultra processed foods kind of lie to us. Um, and so the ultra processed foods, if we look at, you know, what they do is they drive up appetite and they decrease satiation and they lead to weight gain. It's almost the exact opposite of what we're seeing with these, these GLP-1 drugs. And so ultra processed foods lead to overeating too many calories over time. Uh, that leads to energy overload. Energy overload is kind of what we see as the you know, precursor uh, to, to insulin resistance. Um, and, and really sadly, you know, 50% of calories that Canadians consume are ultra processed. So this isn't just an academic thing. Um, this is most of what we're eating or almost most of what we're eating. In the US, I think it's like 60% or 60 plus percent. And it greatly enhances our likelihood for obesity, diabetes, and, and hypertension. Um, so it's driving a lot of the problems that we're actually using medications to treat. And if you look at kind of, uh, you know, where, what the problem is, and, and you look at kind of what's happening is, um, and this only goes to 2009, uh, but we're increasingly eating away from home. So we're no longer eating at home. We're increasingly eating fast food. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and even within the home, we're getting takeout from, from, from restaurants and, and the foods that we're bringing home are, are increasingly packaged and processed. Um, if we look at the all, you know, the, the fast foods, we, we've driven up the size and portions of these kind of incredibly from wh what they were in the 1950s to, to now. Um, and so ultra processed foods, I can't, can't kind of present this without even kind of going to a little bit further. Like, look at the risks that they drive. So there's numerous studies just looking at the type of food, just simply by the processing status of the food. Um, and you can control, like, this is what is also important to understand. You can, in these studies, you can control for all sorts of other things. You control for, actually, for fiber. You can kind of take out that factor, yeah, factor out what the, the decreased fiber component or the decreased, you know, uh, other components are. And there's still just the processing of the food in this ultra processed food manner uh, drives up the risk of you know type 2 diabetes of, of kind of all-cause mortality or death cardiovascular disease cancers high blood pressure fatty liver disease inflammatory bowel depression dyslipidemia frailty irritable bowel syndrome dementia it, it really drives up the risk of pretty much everything that we're seeing uh you know in in the clinics these days if you look at it from mortality this one's kind of a uh, you know, very interesting, just a 10% increase in calories from ultra processed food diets. So 10% would be like, you know, uh, you know, one Timbit, half a can of Coke, 23 M&Ms. That actually correlates with a 14% increase in mortality if you're doing that every day, right? So um, huge, huge kind of issue here. And so kind of, you know, going back to it, you know, these ultra processed foods are really kind of hacking our, our our, 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 our natural satiation signal and they're leading to this weight gain. And so if we look at it in the same way that we looked at the GLP-1 drugs, you know, you, you see that they kind of have effects in almost all the same, same areas and, and the opposite. 
Um, so they increase liver fat. Um, they there's a rapid absorption of nutrients and decreased delivery of fiber. Um, it, they increase appetite. They're increased you know, palatability. So you want more. There's increased reward. In the muscle, they decrease insulin sensitivity. There's actually decreased glucose uptake in the muscle. So more of that carbohydrate that doesn't get absorbed into the muscle goes to the liver, gets turned into fat. Um, and they need to, you know, and the pancreas, they need more insulin release. Uh, they, and they actually increase insulin and increase glucagon, and they actually decrease and harm our beta cells. Um, and so kind of comparing them to the GLP-1 drugs, it's, it's like, they're kind of like mirror images of each other. Um, and so, you know, this is my cynical self um, going, you know, we've got companies selling us ultra processed foods and we've got companies selling us GLP ones. And maybe this is the new balance that we're seeing uh, in, in our society. Um, and I think that that's, that's something that we, we, we need to avoid. Um, so that, you know, is a little bit kind of around uh, how the GLP ones work and a little bit of a rant around kind of our overall food supply and that these GLP-1s might be countering. But let's look at how well these drugs work. Um, and so from an A1C uh, reduction standpoint, uh, it's pretty impressive. 1.6% is a very impressive reduction in A1C if we look at it from uh, just looking at some of the research around systemic glutide. Um, when we look at it from body weight, um, we get some pretty impressive body weight reductions uh, on semaglutide. Uh, and in fact, when you look at, uh, you know, that, that 15% margin to, to get rid of insulin resistance, um, you know, uh, a quarter of people are getting there, uh, in this study and, and, this, and there's, there's greater weight loss in, in some other studies. Um, so, so really impressive in terms of the weight loss. Um, when we look at terzepatide or Montero, uh, kind of the new kid on the block, um, there's even more impressive weight loss that we're seeing. And in fact, when we look at it from the standpoint of the number of people that could get to that 15% weight loss target, you know, these, these are game changers. And so the point of this webinar is not to say these drugs are bad. Um, they actually have the potential of being absolute game changers in diabetes reversal. Um, but I wanted to put them into context. Um, they also have cardio renal benefits and I won't get into a lot of detail with this, but for certain people that either have cardiac disease or renal disease, um, these drugs have extra benefits that may warrant actually being on them uh, independent of weight and independent of glucose. And, and so that's something that kind of, uh, you know, you work out with, with, with your physician and with your specialists uh, to, to figure out. Um, as I said, when it comes to reversing insulin resistance, it's all about the weight. Uh, and we th usually think it's about a 15% weight loss to get kind of under that personal fat threshold where we can start to see that significant reduction of insulin resistance. Well, these drugs are really going to be helpful here. And if you look at the pipeline of drugs that are coming, um, we're going to have really kind of some wonderful things in the toolkit uh, to, to help kind of get more people across the line. So one question though we have to ask is, is all the weight that's lost from these drugs, is it all fat? And actually no. And this is something that, you know, kind of if you look at uh, the, 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 the studies, it, it's not, right? So um, in the STEP trial, what we see is 40% of the weight loss was from lean mass and 60% was from, uh, from, from fat. Um, and you know, one of the things we also see is that, you know, you, as the weight comes down, when you stop it, the weight seems to go back up. And, um, and now the trouble with some of this is they, they don't do a lot of DEXA data. So, you know, so there is some DEXA data on some of these drugs, but a lot of the trials, you know, they only do it on a subsection of, of people and they don't do it, uh, you know, in terms of their weight regain. So we actually don't know kind of what the body composition of, of people when they regain the weight looked like. Um, and so again, back to thinking about how these drugs work, right? If they're decreasing our appetite uh, and increasing our satiation, we're going to eat less. And um, the problem is, you know, and I, I say this over and over again in our program, when we eat food, we, we will store, you know, carbohydrates, we will store, uh, fat, but we don't actually store protein other than in the muscle, right? And so our muscle kind of becomes our protein depot. And so the problem, if we're not eating enough, especially if we're not eating enough protein, um, is we start to lose muscle. And, and this isn't a really good thing. Obviously, uh, our muscles are our metabolic engine and for being metabolically healthy, 
we want to ha- have and preserve as much muscle as possible. So we worry about the risk of, of these drugs uh, in terms of you know, muscle loss. Um, and, you know, and, and, and really kind of sarcopenia, which is, is where people, uh, you know, get significantly low in terms of their overall muscle and, and become frail. There are side effects with these drugs, um, lots of GI side effects. Um, and it kind of makes sense because some of these side effects are exactly that way, what you feel when you're full, right? So a little bit nauseous, um, I guess diarrhea and vomiting is don't usually feel, feel out too much. Um, but they're pretty high rates of side effects. And, um, and this can usually, you know, we usually can do well with starting these drugs at a lower dose and titrating them. Um, but sometimes some people just can't tolerate these drugs. Um, the other thing that I see in practice is often people will, will tolerate the side effects for a period of time until they lose the weight. And then they, there's less motivation to take the drug. They stop them. And, and we start to see, um, we start, we actually start to see the weight regain. So, so that can be a problem with this. Um, we look at long-term risks and benefits. Part of the problem is we don't really have any good long-term data yet. Um, so we only have really two year data on, on, uh, on this. Now the drugs have, you know, semaglutide has been around longer than that. And the GLP ones have been around longer than that. Um, but you know, some of these things will take a lot longer to really understand the full, full long-term, uh, effects of them. Um, and I, and I think that some of the long-term risks are going to come back to that, that lo- potential loss of muscle. Um, we are starting to see the long-term benefits. You know, there's, there's some studies that are emerging again around the cardio renal protection that I think is helpful. Um, the drugs are expensive. Um, so that's a challenge. Um, and not, they're not, uh, you know, they're not covered by all people's, uh, insurance and a lot of people don't have insurance. Um, so they're, they are expensive. Uh, Pharmacare has some special authority around this. So you, you can get some coverage there. Um, you know, they're, you know, cheaper in Canada than they are in the U.S., but they, they still are expensive. Okay, when should these drugs be used, right? So we, we've, we've got some really powerful drugs. We've got some drugs that um, can help us lose weight and can help us get below that kind of 15% that we need to get under our personal fat threshold. Uh, so when should we use these drugs? Um, so my view here is, is that these drugs are things that should come after adopting the lifestyle change. So after a program like four plus two, after you've kind of figured out a way to, you know, e- you know, as we say, eat to lower insulin, kind of the whole food approach, you know, you're getting enough fiber, you know, you're getting enough protein. You're watching the glycemic load of your food. You're active. You're using your muscles. You're getting 150 to 300 minutes per week of exercise. You're doing resistance exercise twice a week. You're not doing anything that's going to add fat to the liver and you've kind of got your, 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 uh, you know, your metabolic switch working so that you're able to burn fat, managing stress and, and sleep. Um, if kind of after doing all that, we're not really losing enough weight to get rid of that insulin resistance, then these drugs can be a game changer for people. And, and this is where I think that the kind of whole positive part of this revolution kicks in. Um, but not everybody needs GLP ones. And so here's like a little case study of, of somebody who, who came in at the BMI of 37.6, uh, lost kind of that 15, you know, 13.9%. So pretty close to 15%, A1C, uh, 7.9 to 5.7. And it really correlated with improving kind of the nutrition and improving exercise. So again, you know, not perfect, but way better and didn't actually need the GLP ones. So, um, so that's just, you know, obviously a single case study and, and kind of over time, it's going to be individual for you, I guess is really kind of the point is that some people can benefit from it. Some people will, will not need it. Um, you really have to be minimizing the ultra processed food because you know, ultra processed food is, 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 is pretty much the inverse of kind of what these, these drugs do. It makes no sense to, to be doing that. So you really want to kind of make those steps and, and work your way through kind of minimizing the ultra processed foods. Um, I've said enough about this. Um, we want to be sure that you're, 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 you're having enough fiber. And so kind of 30 to 40 grams per day. Uh, because remember the fiber is the food for your healthy bacteria, your healthy gut bacteria, um, are going to turn that fiber into these things called short chain fatty acids, uh, which increase satiation hormones. Like they actually, they work on pretty much all appetite and satiation hormones. Um, so when you're getting enough fiber, you get better signals to the brain around fullness. Um, and so that's really helpful. We want to maximize protein. And so we want to be sure that uh, you're getting enough protein to maintain muscle, um, and to potentially build muscles as we exercise. 
Uh, and we want to have this in place before we go on a GLP-1 so that we uh, we can be very conscious of that, uh, you know, the amount of protein that's required uh, when we're on the GLP-1. Um, and again, kind of uh, another reminder, protein is the most satiating macronutrient. So if you're getting hungry post-meal, think about that protein. We want to be sure we've had that exercise out, right? And, and, and again, you know, we can't really get protein into the muscle unless we're exercising. So that, you know, that becomes a big factor here as well. Um, and we want to, you know, generally want to have people doing resistance exercise by the time that they try these drugs. Um, the other thing that I would encourage you to think about if you go on these drugs is, is actually track your muscle mass a little bit, right? So, um, you know, get a DEXA scan done. They're not that expensive. Um, they're certainly, you know, they're, they're kind of like half a month's worth of GLP-1, so about $100, $150. Um, and you can actually, you know, figure out how much kind of at baseline lean muscle mass you have. And you can see kind of as you're losing uh, weight, you can be confident that your your lifestyle strategy is preserving your muscle mass along the way. So that's a, that's a consideration. Um, and then I think this is really important. We need an exit strategy for these drugs. You know, what's the lowest effective dose that you can take um, to, to, you know, either achieve blood sugar control or achieve weight loss? What's the shortest duration you can take the drug? And, uh, and then as we, we, we look at kind of coming off these drugs, we need to wean them slowly, right? So um, they're going to have a rebound effect if we just suddenly drop them. So we're going to want to wean them slowly and, and just be sure that we kind of uh, can deal with that. Um and then frankly, you know, you just have to have a strategy to avoid this, right? Um, this isn't going to help anyone, right? To go on these drugs for, for uh, you know, a year or 18 months and come off them and regain all the weight, I think you're going to be worse off. I mean, the way I like to think about it is, yeah, you're going to lose all that fat uh, and lose that lean ma muscle mass. When you regain, it's not like you're going to regain muscle, right? You're probably going to replace, you're going to end up replacing uh, muscle with fat, which isn't going to be helpful. So conclusions to, to this, with great power comes great responsibility. Um, lifestyle first, it really is important to do this first. GLP-1s only when necessary, right? They are, you know, they are a game changer. I love having them in the toolkit as a physician. I just don't think we should be using them as a, the first thing, right? I think we got to do the lifestyle first. And if you need them, you're going to be better off from having that, the lifestyle in place. Um, and then have this exit strategy. So lowest dose, shortest duration, and uh, wean slowly. Okay, awesome. So uh, we hope you enjoyed that presentation. And um, if you didn't get a chance to come to the webinar live, that was uh, that was a recording of it. So you now uh, have had the opportunity to see it. So um, I know during the webinar, there obviously was a bunch of Q&A questions that were sent in and kind of chats that were put in that you didn't see during the recording. So any of those stand out that you kind of wanted to address um, uh, here on the recording? Yeah, there was a really good one that um, asked, you know, why, you know, why lifestyle hasn't been recommended before, right? And um, and kind of a comment that the the uh, you know some of the general practitioners uh, are comfortable prescribing these drugs, but why aren't they prescribing the lifestyle mm. uh, components uh, and um, and so one of the things that I, I kind of commented on was, you know, even when you look at our program, the science is, you know, the science that it's based on a lot of the key pieces have only come together in the last five or six years. So, mm -hmm. you know, the direct study, Roy Taylor, Mike Lean in, in, in the UK, um, which showed, you know, kind of that 86% remission where people lost 15% body weight. That was only in 2018, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the Kevin Hall study, which I reference in this presentation around ultra processed foods and really kind of showing the, the role of ultra processed foods, that was only released in, in 2019. Um, the study showing that uh, there's no difference between bariatric surgery and any other form of weight loss when it comes to metabolic health was 2020. Yeah. Um, and so, so re really it's hard to expect given kind of all the things that the GPs have to keep track of, it's very hard to expect yeah. them to be hundred percent up, up on this, this literature. Um, the, the other thing that, that, you know, um, we see is, is kind of how, how do GPs learn about kind of things that are in the community? They, they often learn from patients going through it. So, um, 
I think that, you know, talking to your GP and letting them know that this program exists and letting them know that it's evidence-based and, um, and that it, you know, works on principles like better, not perfect. And kind of our whole approach, I, I think talking to GPs about that and, and helping them understand it is, is really helpful. And, and a lot of our best referrers now are, are people that have, you know, they got that feedback. Um, yeah. The other thing I think is, is just, um, you know, telling kind of, um, you know, friends and family that are kind of looking at, 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 you know, taking these drugs, I think having them, uh, you know, reach out to, to us around the program to, to do lifestyle first, um, is, is also going to be helpful in terms mm-hmm. of just starting to get this out that, that there are other approaches. Um, and in fact, you know, really kind of lifestyle should always come before using these drugs regardless. And, um, you know, we're, we're certainly building the capacity to take, you know, to have as many people as possible do the program. So, um, sure. we're really happy to see them. And every time a new person comes, it, it allows us to connect with their doctors and, and help their doctors actually incorporate this into their practice. Um, the one, one last thing I'll also say is these GLP ones have actually, they, they, they've, they've changed how we think about weight in our society. Mm-hmm. in a very short period of time yeah. because the dominant narrative around weight was always, you know, calorie in calorie out, right? Like if you, if you just were more disciplined and didn't eat that food and you were more disciplined and you would exercise more then you'd maintain your balance. And that's, yeah. So yeah. it's been very much a, a calorie in calorie out. It's your fault. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and interestingly, <laughs> yeah, I said this in, in one of the questions answer the biggest proponent for that if you if you go through the studies that come out on that um because they they came out there's a kind of calories a calorie there's a whole bunch of studies that came out kind of referencing this and there was a, a bunch of stuff work done on, on exercise as medicine now mm. i do believe exercise is medicine but the movement around exercise as medicine was funded largely by coca-cola and it was funded wow. on this basis that you know if, if you've got a weight loss pro- or weight problem with our products it's clearly because either you don't have enough discipline or you're not, yeah, you know, you're not motivated the coke away or... <laughs> Yeah. And, and, and so then the GLP ones come along and people take this drug once a week and they find that they lose weight. They're just not interested in food. Yeah. And it's not conscious. They're not thinking about it. It's because, it, so anyways, it's, it, you know, you, you've, just, you've just seen the webinar. Um, mm-hmm. it changed the way we think about it. We, we now, I think, I think more people realize that, our, our appetite and satiation is, is in a subconscious part of our brain that's influenced by a lot of things. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and that, so that's kind of changing the attitude. I think it's just as long as we realize that, you know, if we understand how GLP ones work, we should also understand how ultra processed food works and we should exactly. be doing as much effort as possible to, to, to not have that in, in, in our lives. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, um, so yeah, thank you so much for watching um, the podcast today. Um, we hope you enjoyed that uh, presentation that we showed you. Um, as always, if you know anyone that would benefit from the podcast or the program, make sure you share it with them, um, send the link to them and let them know um, about the podcast. And if you'd like to sign up for the Lifestyle RX program, it's provincially covered in uh, BC, Alberta and Ontario. And you can do that at lifestylerx.ca. Uh, so thank you again for, for your time today, Brendan, and we'll talk to you next time. Thanks, guys.